Okay, so we're recording. Uh, thanks so much for um, listening to this video, either in real time or later on. My name is Deb Maybury, and today I'm going to be speaking with Dave Rogers, who's going to speak about the six steps for financial fitness. Uh, welcome, Dave. Welcome, and thank you so much, Deb. It's great to be online with you, and hopefully we'll be adding some value to our listeners and viewers today. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the way this originated was I was looking at my portfolio and my financial situation now and thinking in the future. And I had a lot of questions and I called my advisor, had a, you know, a good conversation with him. And then I thought of, again, I just have this abundance of people that I know. It seems like I'm so fortunate. And um, I thought of Dave, who has, uh, I'm going to let Dave introduce himself, but he has years and years of ex expertise in the market. So I thought uh, when I want to know something, I want to go to the master. So I contacted Dave and we started to have a conversation and I said, okay, well, wait a second, let's hold on the conversation and let's record this. Let's go on zoom and share this knowledge so everybody can benefit from it. So that's what we've decided to, to do. And that's why this video is, is taking place. The uh, markets are so volatile right now. Uh, it's unprecedented what's going on. And when we were talking, Dave, you know, you said, well, go back to the depression and have a look. And I went, back and I looked and I, you know, all I was seeing was zzz, the markets just diving to, you know, to, to, to nothing and people losing all their money. And that's the concern. So my, my first, I want you to introduce yourself and then uh, maybe jump into my first question or, or, or thought was, um, and I know you're going to go through the six steps, but it was when this all started to play out. So obviously we're talking about COVID-19 and the, the global devastation that this disease is, is causing and will cause. What was your reaction as a trader? So individually, what's your reaction? And then also, what is your reaction in terms of the masses? You know, the people that have all their money in their portfolios and they could potentially lose half of their life savings, you know, before this hits the bottom. So introduce yourself and then yourself as a, as a trader and then um and the masses all right well great uh, my name is dave rogers and i've been in mar in the markets actually since i was 13 years old I, I bought my first stock when i was 13 and throughout my teenage years i was uh, guided by an uncle of mine who was very avid he was a uh, one of these guys who used to have the maps of the gold mines and the diamond mines and that he used to take the northern miner and and do research into all these stocks penny ante mainly and uh, i saw him go boom and bust about five times in, in about four years. And it gave me a, a perspective of somebody who does research can really find out how to invest. Uh, whenever he got a really good investment, he jumped into ego and he thought he was the king of the, the hill and he ended up blowing himself up. And so I had some real good learnings as a teenager of how to do the research, but also how the mental component of it is so important in investing. And it did trigger an interest in for me to be involved in the markets. And I did move uh, into the finance field and got a job with the Royal Bank of Canada. And for seven years, I was the risk manager. And I happened to be the risk manager in Japan when the Japanese market went from 10,000 to 20,000 to 39,000. And everyone thought it was the greatest market in the world. And and uh, the risk managers, though, had questions about it. And they doubted things. And they, they poked holes through all of the philosophy that the Nikkei was going to go to 100,000. Well. Lo and behold, it did crash and it went down by 25%. It went down by 50%. It went down by 75%. It went down all the way to 7,000, 39,000 to 7,000. And today, over 30 years later, it's still half what it was. And so that is a backstop of can this market stay down for a long time? Well, guess what? Yes, it can. And, and having that experience is something that's useful to to be aware and it's about being aware as opposed to being afraid and i'm not here to, to get people afraid i'm actually here to to share some ideas that we can change our relationship with money we can change our relationship with trading we can change our relationship with investing and that's what i've been finding right now is this going through this latest crisis uh which again in chinese if you got the character crisis it's also the opportunity the word for opportunity. And so after Japan, I had ended up going to Hong Kong and I was in Hong Kong during the Asian crisis. 
again, this was 1996, 97. This is when the Minister of Finance in Thailand was pounding the table and saying, we'll never devalue our currency. And three days later, the currency went from 24.5 to 48. Immediately, everyone's savings were gone. They're a half. Some people jumped off bridges. Some people killed themselves. That's part of the reality. And so that was an experience. I was managing a billion-dollar portfolio. I came in one day, and my French bosses said, cut your portfolio by half. And so I had to cut the portfolio by half. I actually had clients, Korean institutions, that went bankrupt. I had to sell their portfolios. And it wasn't sold at 50 cents on the dollar or 75 cents on dollars. It was sold on 5 to 10 cents on the dollar. That's what happens in forced liquidations. That's what is happening a little bit right now. We're not hearing about it, yet that's what is happening to some people, especially those people who for the last three to five years have been riding the, the train and feeling rich because they're borrowing money and they're leveraging. They're going on margin. Margin is great when the market goes up. Margin kills you when the market goes down. And that's what we're starting to see. And that's what we're, we're seeing with this huge volatility at the end of the days, particularly right now, when the machines are doing the trading. And so yesterday, we had a, probably a 3 to 4% extension. Royal Bank, 12% moves. That's, again, unprecedented. Yet, when you understand and you bring in the factors of technology, speed of transaction, machine trading, artificial intelligence, these are the exacerbating the extremes in the trading in the markets, which can be either extremely frightening or pretty exciting. And so it depends on which side of the market you're on and whether you're investing with money that you're comfortable to learn. Because I really truly believe this is about learning and earning. It's sort of like the, the L plate on when you're learning how to drive. Once you drive a little bit, you, the L plate drops off and you can actually get into some of the earning that's available right now in the marketplace. And so from my experience from Tokyo to Hong Kong, I then moved to Singapore. And that's when I was an entrepreneur. In 2008, when we had the, the global financial crisis, I had 11 businesses at the time and we shut down eight of them because of that year. At the beginning of the year, we had about $5 million in, in, in the bank to expand and to become a publicly listed company. By the end of the year, we had lost most. We had shuttered most of our business. We had let go of most of our people. And again, that was an emotional experience of having to let go of people and something that has built a, a certain amount of empathy and compassion. Yet, in many ways, do we really recover from some of these wounds? Well, let's hope so. Can we learn from these experiences? Let's hope so. And that's why I'm here today. I really want to share some, some steps to increase financial awareness, some financial fitness. And it's also a process that I started when my son was eight years old in 2008. And so I'm happy to be able to share it with people today because he started it when he was eight years old. And I'm pleased to say that even though he's going through his journey right now of trading and learning, and he's now learning me because he's using some of the new technology in trading. Something that yeah, share, you probably- Share a couple of those things something that you and I probably aren't too familiar with, but there's trading now with non, non cost trading. Like most of the young generation, young uh, generation are having platforms where they don't have to pay any commissions anymore. So that's something I'll be sharing today too. Is it only for the young people or for the old people? get on? Well, to be honest with you, because of what you asked me to do to come on today. And I was really thrilled. I went and opened up a, a wealth, simple trade account. Uh, it takes it takes three days to fund. So when we talked, I funded the account and I, today I'll, I'll make some trades. And what I'm going to share today is what I'm also probably going to do today. So I like to talk about paper trading, which is again, a way to develop some confidence and some self-esteem and some, some fun in the trading and then put it into the markets, which I really am encouraging people to, to, again, in this presentation, we're going to go through the, the psychology of investing and, and hopefully you can share some of your blocks and, and fears and worries. And, and that's great because once it's said, it becomes released in many ways. And so we can, we can shift some of the patterns that some of us have and continue to have because this way, I believe it is a continual journey. Like yesterday's market, in the last three days, we've gone down to 8%, up 10%. Today's probably going to go down. And so if you just see every day your, your account going down and your life savings going down and all your money going down, it's probably not going to be a very fun experience. Exactly. I'm just, 
a little distracted because I have somebody else asking me how to get on. Um, somebody else has joined us. Uh, welcome. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Is um, yeah, when it's going like this or, or and like this, it, it's um, it's it's intimidating and it, and like part of the question that I asked you, like I can see how it's affecting you, obviously, because you're you're knowledgeable. You're you're used to. I mean, you're you're used to, uh, you know, a billion dollar you know, um, portfolio to, to manage that to me would be terrifying, but you're used to that. But there are, are people, um, that, you know, all also age related. So if somebody is, is, you know, 40 years old, 30 years old, they're still working. They've got a lot of, um, years to create, you know, more income. Somebody who is retired, doesn't have that and they're looking at their pol portfolios sitting there and dwindling and they have no idea where it's going to bottom out or how long also that is going to be before it then starts to grow again. So these are real fears and, and understandable. So can you just say something about that before you go into your... Sure. I, I actually, I'll, I'll use one uh, metaphor because <laughs> when you're doing this it, it does remind me of the metaphor that maybe we can use it's like a roller coaster and some people like roller coasters they love roller coasters personally i don't really love roller coasters <laughs> yet some people they live their life with the roller coaster ups and downs ups and downs and they exacerbate them and the funny thing is is that while i have experience with this realistically it's, there's only been really three experiences i've had with uh, the 87 crash the the 97 crash the 2008 crash so it's like those experiences could be very traumatic and then I could live the drama in there. Or for some people, I'm aware that it was very tragic and hopefully I can take some of the magic from it. And so right now, no matter where you are, you could do a, a mark to market on your portfolio. Now, if you're going to focus on what your mark to market, that's the value of your portfolio today. Yet if you're going to look at your value or your portfolio three months ago and you're going to see the difference probably down and you're going to get really sad and depressed, I'm going to encourage you not to. If you want, maybe look at it five years ago because it's probably at a level there. And so it's not as tragic unless you go and sell everything. And that might be tragic because then if it does pop and it does recover, like some people think it's going to do in the next three months, then you're going to be kicking yourself because you sold at the bottom. Now, can it go down another 20%? Yes, I'm telling you it can. Is it probable? we might pop down there, whether we're going to stay down there for the long term, meaning three, five, 10 years, that's probably a very low probability. However, I do point out to people, you can take a look at the Japan market and it has never recovered from the 39,000 level that it once reached. And so having information is not to worry you, it's to inspire you that right now, if you want to learn more about the markets, it's a great time to get the volatility maybe make some money and to have some fun with it welcome holly Can you just hi holly <laughs> just mute yourself there as much as i love bodhi <laughs> oh i thought i was muted okay <laughs> go ahead dave i was just gonna just i hope that does that assist like or you got a follow-up question that um uh, well let me just put that open does, does somebody else have a uh a question they would like to ask at this time with relation to that so again i really want you to to ask yourself are you are you trading right now or are you investing difference trading is you're actually looking at the day-to-day -day and and you're maybe like yesterday market went up maybe you sold some today the market might go down maybe you'll buy some that's trading whereas investing which is what this course is really about it's about taking an opportunity to look at around the world and say what companies would i like to invest in in fact, a big part of it is to change our relationship with being just a consumer or being an investor and looking for the next three years as an outlook, five years as an outlook, 10 years as an outlook. That's where these markets are offering some potential good bargains. Thanks, Dave. So go ahead. Let's, let's talk about the, the six uh, financial. Well, the first one is really for each of us to, to talk about the companies that we like, the services that we like. 
Deb, I'm going to use you as a person to have this dialogue. Like, who, who, what are the companies that products or services, technology, food that you like? Because one of the things that I really encourage people to do is, is to get a group of companies that you like and perhaps becoming a user, a owner versus just a consumer. Right. Well, for myself, what I'm thinking right now is because I'm, I'm not going out. So if I need some odds and ends, I'm and I have done this, you know, for the last six months, really, as I've started to use Amazon more. So if I need something rather than spending an hour, or an hour and a half, even just to run locally um, to Canadian Tire or wherever, I'll order something on Amazon. So we see this, the couple of, a couple of people here today, they have young ones. Do you imagine maybe making a little co-investment with your young one that you buy one or two shares of Amazon. And you're not going to be worried because right now Amazon's going to trade probably between 1700 and 2500. But right now Amazon is the one company that is hiring 100,000 people. Is the outlook for Amazon good? They're, they've got so much cash. They've got so much potential right now. So picking up right now, the shares are about $1,800 and they've been bouncing around a little bit yet. Picking up one share might be an interesting investment, depending on the size of your portfolio. Again, we talked a little bit about portfolios. If you have, say, $10,000 to invest, maybe look at five or six stocks to own that you're hoping to own for the next five to 10 years. So Amazon, I think, would be a great investment for the short term, but also for the long term. But again, we're not selling information on specific stock investment, yet I am talking about specific stocks because I actually am in the markets right now and I'm enjoying it, yet I'm inviting you to go and do some homework about maybe owning Amazon and the fact that you're using it. And right now, talk about service. They're, they're, even their five-day delivery service, they're often coming in at two or three days. And so they've really developed a very powerful company. And the idea here is pick companies that you know do a little research. You can go online, Yahoo Finance, and you can see the, the, the information about the stock. You can do some personal research. Yet the key is that this is a, an approach that Peter Lynch, who was a very famous investor about 30, 40 years ago, who wrote a book called uh, Wall Street, uh, A Walk Down Wall Street. And he basically wanted you to go and go into the stores that you like, uh, go pick products you like. And so it's adapting his process and that's a, probably a pretty decent investment for you. Okay, great. So some good tips to also do some research, which I think is, is, is really important. And if I could change only a few things in my financial past, I, I certainly would have done uh, more research in, in 2008 because I know I got hit hard. And yet, right at that time, we were sitting in Bali together. And if I had just, I remember exactly, I can see where exactly where you were sitting because we actually had, you asked me a question when we were in the group that day. And if I had just turned to you and said, Dave, tell me about financial fitness uh, because the stock markets are crashing, I would have been much better off. And it's fascinating. I was going to start today's talk with just asking everybody, where were you in 2008? Because again, 2008, just think about it. Many of you were probably still in school or, or you were, were, again, maybe starting a first job or maybe you had just been going through a, a different relationship experience. Yet 2008 is an interesting year. And that's one of the things I, I want you to, to tap into. 2008, we were in Bali talking about it. We could have had this similar conversation where I would be saying, pick three or four or five stocks that you would like. Allow yourself to have a relationship with them. It shifts when you're just a user of Amazon versus you're a stakeholder in Amazon. Right. And you can, you'll then start tapping into the information from Amazon because as a stakeholder, they're going to start sending you information. You're going to get the wisdom from the founder of Amazon. So he's going to tap into your energetic field and you actually will energize it with money. And that energizing with money is going to create a back and forth if it's, used in a way to nurture prosperity, it's going to give you not only information, it's going to give you timeliness. It's going to give you, if it gets crushed and it goes down to 1500, are you going to sell it? Or you think, wow, now it's a, even a better deal and you're going to buy maybe another share. And that's, that's the thing, thing, right? That's the mentality of the, of the, the trader, right? So listen, I was, uh, I had stocks in, what was it called? Or Nortel and neighbors. I know that they had their um, 
you know, uh, one of them, I don't remember which one, but the parent had passed and they had invested all of that into Nortel. And of course we know what happened to Nortel. I mean, everybody lost everything. Well, actually, let me tell you a story about Nortel, if it's okay. Yeah. Because that was my biggest holding in 1987. Nortel was the best company in the world that 1987 to 1997, it was rated one of the top companies in the world. And I had my, my biggest holding was in Nortel. Yet as again, as a trader, what you're doing, when it goes up, most people will get greedy. Yet a trader will sell a little bit as it goes up. It's called a little cha-ching. And so as it goes up, you sell a little bit too. As it goes down, you buy a little bit. That's trading around a position. So any of the ideas I'm suggesting today is if you have a, a relationship with the Royal Bank of Canada, again, it's likely going to be around in the next five years. Right now, you're getting a 5 to 6% dividend depending on the rate. What are you getting for your deposits in your accounts right now? Probably less than 1%. So for you, again, especially with young ones, if you started a relationship with the Royal Bank where you become a stakeholder and you're getting a 5 to 6% dividend, wow. And if it drops another 10%, would you want to buy some or sell some? Yeah. And so that's the idea of trading around a position and having a relationship with the stock, with the company, with the information, and being a user. It really gives you an opportunity to even get to know the company better than some of the analysts on Wall Street. And that's a pretty cool thing because many of the talking heads that we are watching on the media, they might only have three to 10 years experience. And maybe this is the first time they're going through a financial crisis and maybe they are losing all their money because they're leveraged. And so they're really giving you their a process that they've worked on and that they've developed. Again, I, I'm noticing that some people on CNBC and that they're talking their book. And talking their book is they're actually speaking to try to get people to take action so it improves their profit position. That, way back in 1987, 88, that was against the law. That was called front running. That was called insider trading. That, again, the gray area right now, I think, on the financial media is definitely something to question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. You know, I was, you mentioned RBC. I was going to say CIBC because that was... We talked about that the other day too. Well, I, 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 to be honest with you, I bought some last week, and again, I, 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 I saw an, a seven, eight percent dividend. Like, where can you get an eight percent return right now? Many people for the last five years are saying you can't get eight, eight, nine percent returns on the market. Wow, are they giving a dividend of that? Now, can dividends be cut? Yes. Be aware, dividends can be cut. I've had a number of shares over my life where they cut the dividend. Yet right now, many of the banks are not likely gonna cut their dividends. Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? No. And that's one of the things, when I saw CIBC at a, a, a high 7.87% 7, 7 dividend, I thought it was a good time to, to take a little nibble on that one. So I actually sold a couple of shares and I just picked up some CIBC. Now, immediately when I sold it, it dropped 6% more. Was I worried? No. Was I gonna buy more if it dropped 15%? Yes. Now this is the idea of managing the expectations, but also managing the emotions. Because most people, when it goes down, don't want to buy more. And I'm not encouraging people to put all their money in one basket. That's definitely not the idea. It's to create a portfolio of five to six companies that you would like to be an owner of. I think that feeling of being an owner of the top companies in the world is a mindset shift very different than it's ever really been taught. And that's one of the reasons why I, I think we, we stand a little taller when you walk into Amazon and you, you know you're a part owner in Amazon or you're buying something. And so that's part of my investment philosophy because I want it to be fun. And the fun component is, can it still be fun when you're losing money? Well, guess what? When it goes down, you can also make money. And so that's one of the things that you can explore. <laughs> you're, you're, you're asking if I, what I've been done lately. And, I was talking to my son about the volatility in the market about two weeks ago, and I was just about to buy the VIX. And the VIX is an index that allows you to bet against the market. And it was at 13. The next week it went to 40. And I, I, so that's one of the ones that I sort of shake my head because I was talking to my son about it. I was both about to buy it the next day and I didn't, I missed it. Guess what? It's okay when you miss things. That's part of the market too. It's like the roller coaster. If you go up and down three times, you might miss the, the one time to scream. You beat yourself up? No. You 
get back on the roller coaster and have some fun if you like roller coasters. If you like tranquility and peace, you can do that with the markets too because that's part of your relationship with the markets, your relationship with investing, and really it is about you asking questions that are relevant for you. And that's what I'm encouraging people today. Please ask a question about you. If there's a fear, if there's a doubt, if there's, there's a, a releasing, a healing that you're looking to find, that can be done too because the markets is a great teacher. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Uh, Dave, one thing that I do want to ask you is, because you have so much experience when you're talking, even some of the, the terms I marginally know, you know what you're talking about. And in some cases I have no idea what you're talking about. And in other cases I do understand, but for us average investors, we've gone to the bank or some advisor and they are creating our portfolios for us. And a lot of the times people don't even know what is there, like what you actually own. You don't even know let alone going on, um, I forget what you called it, uh, the no cost trading. Right? Wealth simple trade. I'm not, I, I don't get any commissions or anything for wealth simple trade. It's just something that I've actually just started mainly because my son told me about it. Right. So, so my question is uh, if, if people wanted to do this on their own, how simple or difficult is that? And you know, how to sort of enter into that some considerations? Well, you've jumped to step six, so. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll get it then. I won't take it out of order. Go ahead. Yeah. Then. Again, up. if you, if I want, I can give a little a briefing of case people. Step six is really about getting started. And getting started is writing down some stocks that you might want to buy. And that's actually step five. <laughs> and so I want people to start paper trading if that's, if they want to do that. Paper trading is in a way that you actually start writing down a little bit of a journal. And I know some people are doing more journaling now that we're sort of in various forms of isolation. Uh, yet, if I was to go back to, to so step six, I want people to start paper trading and then setting up an account. And you can set up an account with your bank, Royal Bank, TD, CIBC, or you can go online to this one called Wealth Simple Trade. And generally these days, it's a 15 minute process online to set up an account. If you haven't done it, I'm encouraging you just do that. Like that's a pro that's progress. And this whole idea is it's not practice makes perfect. It's practice makes progress. And that's what investing is about too. And so again, with the risk management component, if you got 10,000 to trade, I'm not saying go put 10 grand in. I'm saying put 500 in. Because then it allows you to do 20 trades over the next three months. Now, there's some stocks that you might not be able to buy right now because there are $1,500 or $2,000 stocks. Yet that's okay because you can still look for ways to invest in companies that you want to have a relationship over the medium term. And so that's the whole process that I'm looking at. Hi there, guys. Welcome. Can you just mute yourself, please? Thanks for joining in. Thank um, you. So I, what I would say on that, Dave, is that I had a lot – Years and years ago, probably around 2002, I actually went over to a friend who worked at RBC here in Brampton, and he set me up with that, you know, with the Royal Bank, and then I just never really did. That was the Nortel days, and then what happened there happened, and then just in the last year, um, and I'm just confirming that it's not a difficult process, so I went into TD Bank, uh, um, a friend of mine was helping me out, and I set up an account, and I... I put some money into that account and then we explored the various ways of investing and different types of investing. And she actually took me through the whole process. And what I propose now is, is that you can actually just Google. I'm sure there are videos online that are going to go through opening these types of accounts. Am I right, Dave? It's actually like it, it is a process and online has been, it's been made a lot of fun. Before we used to have to sign about 20 different documents. Now it's just basically click all those uh, uh, statements being signed online. So yes, the process is incredible now. And again, if you haven't done it or you have done it 20, 10 years ago and it was agonizing, I do invite you to go and do it again as part of the process to financial fitness. And I think that's one of the things that this whole session today is about financial fitness on one side and then the other component is that any entrepreneur that does this process, I think, can become a better entrepreneur. And, you know, that's what, that's what I, 
I sort of talk it up to it is that I want to learn and then um, and then share and learn more and then share. And that's why I wanted to do this as a Zoom video as opposed to just you and I talking because who can also benefit from this? And the second time I set that up, um, it was done online and it was actually quite pain free. Um, and I didn't even have to go to the bank. I went to the bank because I went in there to transfer funds actually into that account. So, well, that, oh, go ahead. Uh, full, full, full disclosure, because uh, again, my second question. So the, so the first idea is write down some companies and services that you like, okay? And this could be some people still like McDonald's, some people still like DuPont, some people still like uh, Bell Canada, some people like, so what services and companies are you using? So that's the first step. And it just allows you to maybe acknowledge that you don't know very many companies or you do know a lot of companies. That's fine because that's, that's where you are today. The next step is what stops you from moving forward with trading. And so I'll be very honest. When I went into Wealth Simple Trade, they wanted me to connect their account to my bank account and that made me feel uncomfortable. And so the first time I went on, I didn't, I didn't move forward with the process. Yet because of we're having this conversation, Deb, I actually took the process to the second level and I funded my Wealth Simple Trade account with a whopping $999 that came out of my bank account. And so even that experience did trigger some fear for me. I don't like the idea of online um, scams. And so it did trigger a fear. So I want to invite everyone here is that we might have different consciousness about doing online transactions, what happens if, and again, that's important to be aware of because those are the, the, those are the subconscious experiences that might pop up and it might create sleepless nights and might have some unwarranted fears or warranted fears. And so to really enjoy your financial fitness, it's to get an awareness of where there are, might be some gremlins. Maybe you are carrying some of the traumas from the parents or, or even some of the traumas from the, the Great Depression of 1929. And so these things come into play when we're talking about money. These things come into play when you're talking about losing everything. These come into when you say, I've lost 40% of my wealth. So that's something to be aware of. And if you're going to make progress, you're gonna feel the pain or feel the fear and maybe do it anyways. And so I did it. I transferred the money over, I got the account open, and over the next week I'll probably buy, I'll take a couple of nibbles in some stocks to create a portfolio that I can, will be able to talk about it. And I have been doing this for decades because I love the financial markets because any entrepreneur who's really, as an entrepreneur, should, are, what one of your goals is to be publicly listed. So. Why wouldn't you want to learn from all of the companies that already are publicly listed? Because it shows you a pathway of what you have to do to do it. And so if you're going to not be interested in finance, you're really never going to be able to grow a business because finance is such a key component in growing a business. It's one of the key resources that allows you to scale and build a sizable business. So when you talk, thanks so much. When you, when you talk about um, what are you uncomfortable with? Hmm. Next step. Um, for me, one of the things that, you know, I had this long conversation with my friend who's online every single day, all day long, and she's watching and making trades and she just loves it. She has all the time in the world and that's what she does. But one of the things that I'm uncomfortable with is then having to actually watch these and how often do I have to watch them and, and um, you know, what is safe to purchase? You know, you mentioned Bell and, and the banks and I would assume people need those services so they're relatively safe, but do I have to watch these, you know? Not as an investor. As an investor, you make the investment and then you start the relationship with the company and you might be curious to learn a little bit more about it and you start tapping into financial awareness. And Bell Canada will be giving you some really good information on G, uh, 5G. And so one of the biggest trends that's happening right now that you're not aware of if you're not in it is going to come from one of the companies that you then possibly will invest in. My analysis for the last three months was whether I wanted to invest in TELUS or Bell Canada. And so I did a bit of analysis and I ended up saying I want both. And so I bought some TELUS because I've owned Bell for over 30 years. And the beautiful thing about owning Bell for 30 years is that there is something called dividend reinvestment plans or drips 
And so the best companies tend to have drips where you don't have to worry about the dividends that, that you're going to get a, a little check at the end of every quarter or every six months. They actually, you give them permission to rebuy shares. So that 50 shares becomes 52 shares and then 56 shares. And then over 10 years, guess what? You're probably going to have 102 shares. Mm -hmm. And so that for me, if I had young ones, that's actually what I did with my young ones. Okay. So I, I did this little exercise when Justin was eight years old and it basically funded his university. And so it, more importantly, though, it educated him that by 10, he was asking, he was walking down the store and he likes Soto Stream. So he said, Daddy, can we buy that? And I go, well, let's do a little research. And do you like the flavor? And does it mean you're not going to drink Coke or Sprite anymore? You're going to drink Soda Stream? And so we bought the machine. We bought the stock. Six months, he sold half the stock and he got the machine for free. <laughs> and so that's the type of financial fitness and education that I'm really into because that allows you to have a relationship. For me, I, I really loved teaching Justin because I wanted my kid to at least be aware of just not being a consumer because this is the idea of, of moving from just being a consumer to being an owner of companies. Mm -hmm. And that is step three, which is really the consciousness of being a consumer versus being an owner. And so that's where step three, I'm really tapping into your, the conscious question of you're, you're great being a consumer of Bell services and bank services and, and Amazon services. What would it take for you to step into the feeling that, Hey, yeah, I own this company or I own a part of this company. Mm -hmm. And does that shift your relationship with what entrepreneurship is, what investing is? And so your point though, your question was, do I have to look at it every day? No, you don't. You can make an investment. Yet, if you like something, you're probably going to be curious about it. And so that's the energy. I'm, I don't want you to get the feeling you've got to be addicted to buying and selling every day. No. Yet someone who might be watching this may love this so much and they're going to really make it their new hobby. And that's something that, again, one out of eight people, it might be right for them. Yeah. You know, we talked, we, we met with, you know, the situation where we went into the um, sort of personality um, traits of different people in terms of entrepreneurship and Dave, uh, I'm assuming you're still the same, you know, um, um, what, what do we call them for personnel? No, what was it? What was the name of those profiles? Profiles. profiles. Thank you. Uh, Dave is a deal maker. And so that means that he's really good, um, at trading. He just has that sort of personality. Um, myself, um, hot the top um, in, in creating, and I've actually kind of got, gone down a little bit, Dave, with, with Blaze and su Supporter in the, in the last 10 years, definitely more creators. So I'm not really the one that has a good ground feel to watch these all the time. Correct. Naturally. Doesn't mean I cannot learn. And that's Correct. a lot of us um, avoid doing something because of the fear of actually learning or they, they minimize what we can actually learn. Yes. And so there's different, different strokes. There's different people who've got different dynamics. And so there are people with high frequency dynamics. They're always uh, creating things, innovating things. And there's people that are actually very methodical and, and very uh, got their ear to the ground. And then there's people who are really good at systemizing. It's people that are really good at branding and marketing. And so on a business, you want to have different vibes, different flows for different people. And that's one of the things in trading or investing there's two different real approaches. One is the day trading, which I'm not. I'm not necessarily a day trader. I'm doing a little bit more of it right now. And then there's people that will accumulate, like a Warren Buffett. He's owned shared for 50 years. So I've got a little bit more of that. Like I'm happy that I own the first stock I ever bought when I was 13. And uh, it's gone through many gyrations because it was Chrysler. And it's just recently, I got the shares back from them. It's now Dalmer, Dalmer Benz. And uh, yet that's, again, an experience with, educating oneself, but also educating our next generation is what I'm pretty passionate about and not being afraid of it, being engaged by it. And so if it could be a new hobby, you even start taking up, I think it's a pretty fun hobby that could be pretty, pro, uh, pretty lucrative if you make some good longer term investments and you take a longer term perspective. Right. What about the addressing people that have uh, fears or concerns and saying, I don't want to put any money into the market now, or I, you know, I just don't have a lot of money. What would be a sort of beginning step? Well, again, the, the beginning stuff is if you do have 
like 5,000 or 8,000 or 10,000 and you, you really, you create a, a, a bucket and then over the next little while, because there's going to be some opportunities in the next probably couple of weeks that the market's going to go down a lot. And um, again, I'll give you an example of just financial fitness is we had Enbridge come to the house and talk to us about getting a new furnace. And so my mom probably just would have bought the furnace and just would have been fine with that. Yeah, and I said, actually showed her Enbridge stock that it's like six and a half percent dividend. And so that is their business model right now. They sell lease products to people to buy for the rest of their ownership of a house. So it's a good stable business now for them. And yet their stock has been very volatile in the last two weeks. Yet, is it going to be around in five years? Likely. Is it probably going to protect its dividend six and a half to seven percent right now? Likely. So. And I've owned it for, again, 25 years. So I added to a position. And so that was something that I just decided last week because I did a reanalysis of their, of their business. Before, I thought they were mainly doing pipelines, like TransCanada Pipeline, which again is, is a, a fairly stable investment, yet given the volatility of oil, more, there's more fear there. Yet for longer term investments, they don't really think that TransCanada Pipeline is gonna be disappearing in the next six months. Uh, and it will be able to give you a five, six, seven, eight percent dividend. So right now, for some people that are, are a little bit afraid of the next couple of years uh, from a cash flow perspective, might look for some of these stocks that their dividend is quite secure, and you might put two, three, four, five thousand into dividends, and you're going to get five, six, seven hundred dollars on revenue and so that's one of the things that i would be looking to do uh from a investor perspective if it's first time investing yeah you, you we'll talk a little bit about that as as we go into your universe or step four and this is really looking at the companies that you could be considered in your universe it expands the idea of the types of companies and i'll, I'll list a few of them because again the first step is me asking you what firms and products and services do you admire how many do you have, Deb? How many? What do I have? Firms, services, products that you that admire. That I like? Yeah. Well, quite a lot. I mean, I'm really loving Zoom right now. Zoom, yeah. okay. Amazon, what else? <laughs> uh, well, you know, the, the banks. I, I have my money at a couple of, of different banks. Good. CIBC, uh, good. Yeah, CIBC, RBC. RBC. Okay. So then the second step was what stops us from investing in stocks. And again, we acknowledge there could be fear. There could be knowledge. knowledge there could be doubts. There could be, again, these are elements that what stop us. And then we go through this step three, the consciousness shift. When we move from a consumer to an owner or investor, and how does it make one feel when they're an owner of a business? Hopefully we get a conf confidence shift, right? And then we talk about discovering your stock universe. And so I'll, I'll, I'll just list a couple of companies that are, are popular right now, and you may circle one of them perhaps. Google, Shopify, Amazon. So any of those companies sort of interesting to you? Well, certainly, uh, you know, Google, because they're Good. just like, they're everywhere. <laughs> okay, so now again, you pick any of one of those stocks, is it likely to be around in the next three to five years? I would anticipate yeah. so. Yes. So Shopify, by the way, is a Canadian company and it's, it's a spec company, yet it's, a, it's, it's empowering solopreneurs. It's creating a platform that allows entrepreneurs to take their products and businesses globally. And it's done very, very well. And again, it's, it's a spec, yet it's a, uh, it is something that I played with recently and I've been investing in also. Um, number two, how about Exxon, Chevron, Tesla, or Royal Dutch Shell? Tesla. Tesla. Again, Tesla is one of these stocks that it's a speculative again, yet if you wanted to be involved in the electrical business, the electric car business, the battery charge business, the space business, wow, like, that might be a fun, again, your shares bouncing right now from 300 to 900. 
it's projected by the most positive analysts, it will be 3,000. Yet to be a Tesla shareholder, I, I joke with my buddy because he bought a Tesla. I said, if you would have bought the shares, you would have paid your, for your car. Oh, that's so true. So another next one is that Westpac, HSBC, JP Morgan, or Royal Bank of Canada, or PayPal. So what I'm doing is I'm just expanding your stock universe. And the next one are your sin stocks. I actually a bit of a sinner. So how about Philip Morris or Diageo or Wynn or Resort Sands for gambling, alcohol, or tobacco? So again, maybe not best for you, Deb, yet somebody who's a constant smoker who loves their cigarettes, why not own Philip Morris? It's got a 9 10% dividend. Be paying for your cigarettes for yourself. So again, getting into finding what's right for different people. Next is, how about Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter? So would you like any of those, Deb? Well, I mean, you know, I really do believe in supporting what you use. So out of those, it would be Facebook. Again, its stock has been incredibly volatile right now. And if you actually look at their revenues and their pro profitability, um, it's probably it's 40% discount over the last two months. Is it going to disappear in the next three months? Not likely. They haven't even monetized Instagram yet. So you can also be looking at these, some of these companies to, to really do some big things in the, in the coming six to 12 months. And the last one, which is, again, is, is so I've, I've taken sort of the technology, the gasoline, the banking, the sins, the social networking, and now some of the food. So Starbucks, my, McDonald's, Domino's, or Chipotle. And again, if you've got young ones, buying a McDonald's share. You might not like McDonald's, but they're actually doing a lot to improve the quality of their food. They've got a great distribution channel. They're actually relaunched totally in China right now. Still probably one of the greatest places to go to the restroom anywhere in the world because they got a clean bathroom policy. Yet the one that has been interesting has been Starbucks lately. Um, it just got pounded, but again, they've reopened most of their stores in China. And the one that is really benefiting from the, from the American dilemma or COVID-19 situation is dominoes. So that little exercise is step four, which is just discover your stock university. So a step for some of you might be in the next couple of days, just go around your house and say, which products you use? Clorox has been one that's been in, in the press a lot just because they're totally out, sold out all their products. So is that stock probably going to, so that would be perhaps something you've missed as a, stock investor because it's pretty high right now yet if you really love their products you're probably not going to mind owning it for five years or 10 years or 15 years it used to have a pretty good dividend but i think it's come down because the stock price has gone up so step five in this little process is diversification and so of, of, of those 20 companies that i just mentioned you might pick four or five that you will then go and look up in Yahoo Finance or online and start doing a little research. Yet what's nice about that little exercise is it gives you different companies in different industries that no matter where the markets tend to go, they're going to perform and they're gonna perform, again, this is the idea. From an information perspective, I'm sure they're gonna be able to teach you something about marketing, sales, funnels, uh, teams, leadership, economics, because once you start getting their information that they're using, it's going to inform you better for an, as being an entrepreneur or intrapreneur or somebody who's simply looking to be a better trader or investor. How does that sound? That sounds, that sounds great. What's the next point? <laughs> this next point is steps. Point. Let me put it out there. Are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Just unmute yourself and, and, and come on. Everybody sitting silently. Okay, go ahead, Dave. So step six is getting started. And so that little exercise I shared with picking a company that might, you might like is it's pick your portfolio, five to six companies, try to have a financial company, perhaps a, 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 
technology company, a social media company, a food company. And again, areas that you're, one that I didn't mention here, but again, Nike, Lululemon, these are companies that Deb, you might like. And so you pick your portfolio, start writing it on paper, have your little trading or investing book. You could even today, if you had $10,000, what would you put it in? You can go check the market prices and you can see how many stocks of each of those that you would buy in your, in your paper portfolio. You could put them onto a Yahoo Finance platform, which is not buying the shares, but it allows you to track them. That's what I originally did with Justin when we did this as his exercise. And then every day he would see if whether his stocks were up or down, it was red or green, and, and he was able to track it that way using an online platform like Yahoo Finance. For those of you who wanna get into the markets, set up a trading account. Again, reach out to Royal or TD or CIBC or Simple Trade Wealth and go through the process of simply setting up the account. It will get to a point where you have to fund the account. If you got a certain amount of funds, chunk it down into about 20 bits. So if it's 10 grand at 500 each, you got 20 trades. I would be inviting people to paper trade or mock trade for a week. Right now, the mock trading is pretty fun because you got this huge volatility. So if you're going to trade, you might be able to buy Royal today at 80 and you might be able to sell it tomorrow at 84, which is a 5% return, which is not bad. Now, it might not be huge in dollar terms because your, your increment or your, 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 your trade size is, is quite small, yet you're developing a confidence. Don't go put 10 grand in the market and uh, then get blown out. Because the idea is risk, risk, risk. You always want to know your risk and you want to stay in the game. Dave, do you, can you do this yourself or do you need to use a broker? Well, we're, when you hear broker, that's what we're using when we're hearing you're using TD uh, Trade or using Action Direct. So that's online trading. And okay. so most of the banks still charge $9.99 a trade, yet Wealth Simple Trade supposedly has zero cost trades okay thank you and so by taking step six where you set up the trading account you start paper trading you put money into it or not it's your choice and then you really look to manage your paper portfolio and when you're ready to put it into the market you take a little bite you pick something you want to own for i would say a, a longer term and then you might be having a portfolio that could look very nicely balanced because it's got different types of investments and you're going to learn about it as you go along. This is about, again, my, my minimum threshold in this, at the very least, I, I believe you will become a better entrepreneur if you go through this process. Would you agree? Would everyone agree with that? Is that if you did simply did these steps that it would equip you with more skills? Um, to manage a business, to build a business, and to invest in a business. Yes, they would nod their head. <laughs> we do have a question. What ethical, what ethical companies would Dave suggest? Uh, ethics is an interesting component. I, I would often ask the person, what are ethical companies that you are considering ethical? Um, these days, the green businesses, so is Tesla, is Tesla considered an ethical business these days? If you look at even the oil companies, which get beaten up as being the most devastating to Mother Earth businesses, most of them have very, very, very powerful uh, green initiatives, whether it's planting trees, whether it's investing in um, renewables. So while the oil companies get beat up a lot by being seen as just raping and pillaging and ravishing Mother Earth, their green initiatives are part of what will be sustainable on this planet. So the people that are putting them down and, and just saying they're no good, actually, I'm not sure if they've ever read the annual reports of these big oil companies, because the big oil companies actually have really robust green initiatives. And that's one of the things if you really are into some of the sustainability initiatives. It's working collaboratively with these multi, multi, multi-billion dollar businesses that will be feeding and fueling some of the initiatives that will plant the trees, that will create better alternatives. And so that's where, as an investor, that's how I'd look at many of the 
the ethical or unethical businesses. Um, some people who say they totally hate the tobacco businesses. Well, go look at some of the ethical things that now the tobacco companies are doing. And um, the soft drink, that's one that's coming under pressure right now, the sugar water drink companies like the Coca-Colas and the Pepsis. Um, I was a, a big fan of the former CEO, uh, Miss Nui from PepsiCo, as she diversified from Pepsi into snacks that were healthy, she into the juices, into other products. So there is a there is a move to bring more ethics and sustainability into most large publicly traded companies. Um, and so I guess that's where it truly is. It's your portfolio that I'm inviting you to explore. If there's things you do want to invest in or don't want to invest in, please you do it. I've 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 chosen to play both sides from that perspective because I didn't like what the tobacco industry did for 20 years because they lied to everybody. They, they, they showed all these reports that saying tobacco didn't cause cancer and all that, and they were able to suppress it. Yet it was a big part of my education into finance to see how that was done legally because they played a gray area. So that is something as an entrepreneur, again, if you're afraid of the law, then you're probably never going to become a, a world-class entrepreneur because the law is such a key component to grow a business. And you actually have to probably be, be sued a few times and be able to use the courts to trademark, to be involved in the legal side. And it, whether you are aware or not, all the top companies, Apple's suing Google and Google's suing Apple and Apple's suing Amazon and Amazon. And so their whole arena of suing and, and using the courts is such a key component as you grow a business. You I'm not sure if that Apple answers Apple. your question. <laughs> Um, I struggled when, um, you know, w w when we legalized marijuana and um, this friend of mine that's an avid investor, you know, she was in that game early. She doesn't, you know, use drugs, but she was very in involved in that uh, from an investor perspective. And she's been bitten on the buttocks because <laughs> well, stocks have not performed very well. So if you are a fan of of that industry again it's it's an important uh, industry to understand like yet most of the investors in the, the marijuana industry have been crushed i think their stocks are down 70 to 90 percent in the last uh, year so as an investor right now I've, I've actually looked at them in the last two or three months because um is it is there still a good sustainable business there that's again if you love it and you actually really like that whole business model then something for you to look at right now. You'd be getting a significant discount. Yeah, I, I guess <laughs> I, I would prefer going with the safe, ethical, what I deem ethical at that moment, I suppose, uh, versus speculating. Yeah, that's the thing. Is even in your portfolio, I invite you to have one spec. Like Tesla is considered a spec. Shopify is considered a spec. Royal Bank is not considered a spec. Um, Bell Canada is not considered a spec. Uh, Trans Canada Pipeline, ethical or unethical, that would be coming down to perhaps some of your stands on oil. Um, so that's what's really beautiful about it is you can design a, a, a portfolio that of products and services that you like, that you use, that you think are good, and that you'd like to have a relationship with these companies that would allow you to have a core investment. And then if the market goes up, you can sell a little bit. If the market goes down, you can buy a little bit. So you can actually see the, tr the trading ranges of these stocks that tend to have a 20 to 30% trading range per year. And so that's where I'm saying, Deb, you don't need to look at it every day. Yet if you do notice it drops to a certain level and you've got a couple of extra dollars, you can buy something low. And then if it goes up six months later and you're noticing it's high, it's hitting its highs, you can sell a couple. And you can keep the relationship with the shares and the company for the long term. That's my favorite way of investing, to be very honest with you. It's, it's something that um, I think it's the average investor can understand. They can have great relationships, yet they don't have to just put the shares in the, in the, in the dresser and forget about them. Because I'm actually encouraging you to develop the relationship with this stock market with the financial markets so it enhances your financial fitness. Dave, there's a there's a question there about gold and silver. Ah uh, I love physical right now. 
I've been checking into ways to get a hold of physical because there's a shortage of physical right now. And so we're probably going to see a pop in that in the next six months. So actually I wrote out to a couple of companies yesterday to see how I can get some physical. I, um, I, I encourage one of your six holdings. If you have six holdings, have one in gold or silver. Um, I've been a long, 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 long term holder of American Barrick. Uh, it's considered one of the strongest gold companies. Yet you will shake your head a lot because the gold stocks, the gold metal, and the gold futures do not trade in a logical manner. Um, there is some logic behind it, is because there's so much manipulation in the market, and that manipulation in the market is often unwound. And that's why you could see silver going from 13 to 40 in the next year. It, you could also see it go back to 10. Yeah, I'm personally long both. And when you're going to buy that type of stock, you, you know, like you, you mentioned a, a name there. What was that name? American? Barrick. It's the, Barrick. yeah, it's the biggest gold company. And um, see, yeah, it's, it's investing in a company. So if you were to invest in Barrick, for instance, you would learn about the gold industry. You would see a Canadian company that has operations around the world and it will show you why owning this gold stock is different than holding a gold bullion that's different than holding holding a gold ETF exchange traded fund the, the easiest way to invest in gold is GLD which is an exchange traded fund and the easiest way to own silver is SLV an exchange traded fund uh, I, I just recently bought the SLV and it dropped thirty percent. I was surprised. Yet I'm still convinced that silver is going to go up, and that's why I'm, I was looking at buying some silver, some physical. There's a disconnect in the market, and that can like the important thing to remember is the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain liquid. That's humility in the market, and so. The market teaches lessons. That's there's a definitely humility with the market. I'm happy to own silver for ever, um, and I've traded it throughout my life. Like that was one of Justin's first investment, and we bought it at around 13. I think he ended up selling it at about 46. And so, wow. yeah, that took about 18 months. And again, that was 12 years ago. So that's the thing about cycles when you start enjoying the markets you know that there's cycles and they're often why aren't things happening in the time frame you want it to happen that's the irrationality of the market and that's becoming even more exacerbated with the artificial intelligence and the machine trading mm -hmm. so that adds a little more volatility which again as a roller coaster rider do you like that volatility <laughs> or do you want to stay away from that volatility and that's part of the reality of the markets these days so when you say someone's seen it or they've seen it all, no, it's, it's, there's a newness to it. What is similar is human beings respond to uh, certain market conditions tend to remain fairly similar. Mm -hmm. and so well, the, psych the psychology of the markets, your psychology around money is what this is about. And that's the invitation that I really um, hope you can enjoy it. Are there any questions? I'm going to be asking Dave for some final comments here in a moment because we're, well, we're at an hour, just over an hour. So if there are some questions, you can unmute yourself and please ask Dave um, before we, we do wrap up. Um, you know, uh, there's, um, there's so much fear out there right now with this virus and, and number one, people's health concerns and concerns with their family and and, and friends, um, people don't have a job to go to for, you know, in so many cases. And so to be thinking about uh, finances or um, this type of thing may be a, a struggle for people to get their head around uh, right now. But um, I think it's something that it's sort of like, if we act and prepare now, then we'll, we will be in a better position later. And the majority of us do have time. It's just creating that, that space and looking, looking at our finances with curiosity 
uh, interest in, in looking how we can take this opportunity to learn. So it looks like there's some people are remaining silent, but they're uh, definitely posting in the chat. Dave, do you want to answer some of those? No, it's just it basically everyone's just saying thank you so much. And I appreciate everybody's time and energy. And oh. yes, really, it's, a, it's an opportunity that some people are saying it only comes around once in a lifetime. I tend to be a little bit more uh, jaded with um, life and lifetime opportunities come about all the time. So yet right now the the markets are extremely fragile and volatile. And as an investor, it might be a time to dip your toe in the market, especially if you've got the appetite that whatever you put in could be 20% less or 30% less. And if you go in little by little, even if it drops 20%, you're not going to be wounded by it. You're actually going to say, oh, wow, Royal is even a better deal at this price. Or, wow, Bell Canada is a better deal at this price. And so the next three to six months, the financial results should be pretty poor, which is uh, the key word that I think Deb and I have been using. It's a reset. So there's a reset going on right now. There's a recalibration going on right now. What's the invitation that we're having to you is reset the relationship you have with money, reset the relationship you have with investing, and perhaps educate and then get involved in uh, your financial fitness. And it's just not like going to the gym once. There's a financial fitness component that it's go, learn, ask questions, if it's still and allow the markets to be part of your life, especially if you're interested in business. Right. Without holding you to it, Dave, would you be prepared to throw out, you talk about, you know, holding in six, six different areas or six different stocks. Mm. Would you be prepared to maybe share if somebody was just starting to look at these six in, in these different areas? Sure. Uh, again, Amazon's a great one. Uh, Google. Uh, Apple. JP Morgan, Tesla, at five, uh, then a nice dividend. Uh, let's pick, oh, AT&T. That's a blend of Canadian and American since we like to holiday in America. And yes, and again, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but the Canadian dollar has been punched in the nose in the last month. And so the currency has gone from about 133 to about 146. And so if you had some American AT&T that was giving you an 8% dividend, just think if you had, again, 10,000 bucks in there, it'd be meaning every year you're getting a dividend check for 800 bucks, can pay for a trip down to the States. And so that's, that would be a, a fairly diversified uh, portfolio that's got some upside. Uh, it's picking some of the best stocks in the world. Uh, I've been a buyer for Apple for again 15 years. Um, I bought it mainly because my son loved Apple products and uh, we've seen it go up and it's still got about 150 billion in cash on hand right now and so it's, uh, it's an interesting stock to look at right now too. Was that six Deb? Yeah, that was, that was six. Thanks so much. What other question for you? So, um, you know, somebody goes to, you know, their typical bank and the advisor says, get this, this, and this, and they do diversify within that and say there's a lot of American in their portfolio right now. Now they're printing money like crazy. Um, again, don't quote me. I don't know much about it, but I'm thinking they're, you know, their situation is going to go downhill at some point pretty quickly. So if somebody had this collection of stocks within their portfolio, high in American, would it be a time to sell that and transfer that over to something else? And if the answer is yes, what would you suggest shifting it to? So what, moving from a fund? See, again, if you go to a bank, the banks will probably get you to want to buy funds, right? Because that's how they make their money too, right? So that's one of the challenges I have a little bit with that the industry is that they basically sell you things because they think you need them. Whereas if you invest in your own stocks portfolio, you're investing in your own education and you're allowing yourself to learn about the markets. 
Uh, Jason says, I like Luckin coffee over Starbucks. Um, again, that's more of a, a speculative trade and a respect that is that if that's one of the speculative stocks you have in your portfolio. Um, and it's definitely going to show some great volatility, but yet because it's earlier in its expansion curve, you put get higher growth with it. You'll definitely get some good whipping ups and downs in the market. And if you can trade it, you may do quite well. Starbucks is probably a good investment for the long run. Uh, it's been beaten up pretty good also. I think, well, last yesterday it was up, I think, 13 or 14%. So that's, that's a speculative versus a longer term investment trade. And again, either of them could be in a portfolio. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dave, for, for coming on and, and doing this. We just talked a few days ago and here we are recording yes. it. And that's what we, I look forward to doing more of this, Deb. Thank you so much. I know it's a great platform and, and I've actually had the opportunity to connect with a lot of people during, you know, just the last two weeks. I'm going to take advantage of this. So, so watch for some things that Dave and I'll do in the future, um, individually and collectively. And, uh, you know, good luck and uh, gain, gain the knowledge and uh, take some time and, and investigate. And, and if you have your money, at the bank, call your advisor, see what's going on, maybe get a feel for that and look at some of these um, suggestions that, that Dave has made. And if you're so in, inclined, pursue and use your own discernment. Absolutely. Everyone take care. Thank you so much. Have a great day and happy investing. <laughs> take care.